Hey everyone, Eric here. Just before we get to today's show, I want to let you know that we're offering our podcast listeners a special 20% lifetime discount to the China Africa Daily Brief. Now that's the newsletter that Cobus and I produce every day that provides the most comprehensive digest of everything China's doing on the continent and now increasingly throughout the global south. To get that discount, just go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe and use the promo code podcast at checkout. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witts University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Okay, Kobus, as we always do now, I want to welcome our newest members to our Patreon community, Kenyatta and Abhijit. Welcome to the club. We're so happy to have you on board. Uh, for those of you who are interested in what we're doing over on Patreon, every week people are getting the new weekly digest that we're publishing, which is the highlight of all the week's news that we produce uh, for our daily subscribers. We do a nice condensed digest. A lot of folks were telling us that it's simply too much to get uh, every single day. They're not, they don't need that much uh, information, but a nice weekly summary of the key stories is what they're getting. Also, uh, Zoom calls we're doing, one-on-one -on -one private briefings and lots of just chats back and forth with folks. So there's a great community forming over at patreon.com slash China Africa Project. Both Kobus and I would so appreciate your support for both what we're doing and the work that we're doing and to support independent journalism. So go over again to patreon.com slash China Africa Project. Okay, Kobus. Wow. Busy week ahead of us right now. We have two major things we're going to talk about today in the run-up to FOCAC. Number one is brand new, hot off the press, new survey data from Afrobarometer. For those of you not familiar with Afrobarometer, uh, these guys are by far the most reputable polling agency in Africa on public opinion. Every five years, they've been doing surveys on perceptions of China and the United States. They just updated their data on Monday of this week. Let me read a few of the highlights. I will admit that we have literally just looked at this, Kobus and I, so we haven't had a chance to digest it. We are in touch with the Afrobarometer folks to bring them onto the show so they can walk us through everything. So I promise you we're going to give you a deep dive in the next few weeks. But let me just give you some of the headlines right now. And Kobus, I'd like you to react to this, uh, again, just right at the top. On average, across 34 countries that they surveyed, China trails the United States as Africa's preferred development model. 33% for the United States, 22% to China. That is pretty much the same as what they had in their earlier survey, if I recall. China's economic and political influence in Africa, like that of the United States, is far more widely seen as a good thing rather than a bad thing. Almost two-thirds of Africans say the economic and political influence of China in their country is somewhat positive, or very positive, while only one in seven, only about 14%, consider it negative. Kobus, that's a very interesting data point that I think may come as a surprise to many of China's critics in the U.S. in Europe who see China's influence in Africa to be much more negative, and the numbers among at least the publics that were surveyed by Afrobarometer much higher than, uh, than I think a lot of people expected. I, I, yeah, it's, I, I find it very interesting. I think it, 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 it really shows the contrast between China's role as a development partner versus some of its other partnerships that it has in, in, the, in the global north. You know, kind of clearly China's doing something as a development partner that Africans like, you know, and, and, and this is very interesting. I, I, was, I was wondering what you make of, of the fact that, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the, the, as a development model, and, and, I, and I think it's, it's, it's important to make the distinction between development model and development partner, but as a development model, um, you know, 33%, you know, favored the U.S., 22% favored China. 
both of those struck me as quite low. It doesn't, you know, kind of it's it's it, like thirty three percent is is the biggest is the biggest one, but it's still pretty low, you know, kind of in, in terms of being inspired by 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 a country. What, what did you make of those numbers? Well, I think there's also a drive for Africa to find its own way and for African countries to maybe draw inspiration from other countries. But this idea of looking to the United States, looking to China or looking to Europe in some kind of paternalistic way may be dated. And the younger generation of Africans who dominate the population today don't see the world that way. And and what we hear consistently from young people in various African countries, and I'm sure you hear this constantly in South Africa, is we want to forge our own path. We want to forge our own identity. And and maybe these numbers reflect that in those no, the, the low approval ratings for development models from, from about the Chinese and Americans reflect that desire. I don't know. That's pure speculation on my part. That's going to be a great question to ask some of the folks at Afrobarometer. Let me just give a couple more details before we move on. Perceptions of Chinese influence declined in 24 countries, including huge drops in Sierra Leone, down 37 points, Zimbabwe down 29 points, Botswana down 24 points, Malawi 21 points, Niger minus 21, and Mali minus 21, uh, minus 20, sorry, at Mali. I'm not entirely sure how they define perceptions of influence. That's quite a broad characterization. Nonetheless, it does reflect a decline in some degree of popularity of the Chinese. Not surprising in this day and age, though, I must say, given the fact that I'm not entirely sure that there's any brand of any country that's doing exceptionally well. Uh, Certainly, there's just a lot of turbulence out there, but that is something that we will find out a little bit more. Last point that I'll get to is respondents who feel positively about the influence of China are more likely to hold positive views of U.S. influence as well. And this is quoting the Afrobarometer report. The two views are strongly and positively correlated. This suggests that for many Africans, U.S.-China quote-unquote competition may not be an either-or proposition but a win-win. So that is also consistent with what you and I have been hearing is that people don't want to be forced to take a choice. Same situation out here in Southeast Asia. People do not want to have to choose between the United States and China. And I think that is probably consistent with most regions throughout the global south. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like the, the big split there is more people who are looking to the outside for models and those who are not, um, which which is which is interesting. Also, in terms of in terms of the the perceptions of of Chinese influence, I think it's important to make the distinction between perceptions of whether there is a strong Chinese influence in in one's country, and then the perceptions of whether those the, whether that influence is good or not. I think those, as far as I understand, those were two different different kind of sections of of the report. And it'll be very interesting to speak to to representatives from Afrobarometer to hear how those two overlap and like, you know, kind of what their thinking was around those results. So I have been in touch with the folks from Afrobarometer. I am trying to get them to come on the show. They're super busy right now. Everybody is very busy also with FOCAC coming up. And that's only one part of the story, though, that just broke this week. And the other part is that for the first time since he is Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken is now in Africa, and he is embarked on a five-day, three-nation tour that will start in Kenya, go to Nigeria, and end in Senegal, three countries that were very interesting selections by the secretary to go to. All three countries have very strong Chinese influences. This is a rescheduling of the trip that he was supposed to go to in August, but was then delayed because of the fiasco in Afghanistan. So not any indication that he did it because of the upcoming FOCAC. We speculated earlier on that maybe he was going now just because he didn't want to come after FOCAC when he would be confronted with the obvious questions of, look what you know China's doing, what's the U.S. doing? So, Kobus, what's your take on the selection of countries and what do you think that the key issues that he's going to talk about are? You know, I, I think in, in in relation to to the issues, I think he'll probably he'll probably like you know kind of follow follow a, an approach that that we've seen from U.S. officials over the last few months, which is to talk about China without talking about China, without mentioning it by name. Well, he'll do his best to do that. Yes. And sometimes he's confronted by the local press and the yes. traveling press in his delegation yeah. to ask him, saying, "What do you think?" Pompeo tried that last time when he was secretary, and he got away with it almost right till the end. And that's when Mike Pompeo brought out the 
you know, the labor issues and then some of the debt trap things that they've been trying to avoid, but it's hard for them. It's really hard. Yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> I, I'm one of the things I'll definitely be checking for is at, at some stage you did a very funny a funny rundown of of how like some of the talking points that Blinken was using in, in relation to China and Africa are almost verbatim you know, talking points, you tracked it back to the Clinton, the the, the Hillary Clinton era, and they, they replicated themselves every few years almost exactly. So I'll be definitely be checking those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally every single Secretary of State from Hillary Clinton in 2011 to John Kerry to Rex Tillerson to Mike Pompeo, all the way, maybe, and all the way up to Blinken, because back in April, he did a virtual trip to Africa, which was otherwise known as a Zoom call. And, and he was asked just a softball question back then about how is the United States going to compete with China? I mean, like, Xinhua couldn't have served up a better floater question. And he went back to these old, dated, out, antiquated talking points about how China's importing labor and there's the debt traps. Again, this is exactly what Hillary Clinton said back in 2011, because I was like, wow, that sounds very familiar. So I went quote by quote by quote of each one of the secretaries of state. So it'll be interesting to see if he has updated his talking points on Chinese engagement in Africa to reflect the new realities. We will hear a lot about B3W probably. This is a key thing. Uh, Dalip Singh, who is the U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor, just wrapped up a tour in Ghana and Senegal where he was on a listening tour. I say with my little air quotes that are popping up, a listening tour to hear about B3W projects in West Africa. It's likely that Secretary Blinken will address that when he is in Senegal as well. It might be a little bit awkward for the secretary, though, Kobus, when he is driving from the airport in Dakar and his motorcade is going to be whizzing by all these Chinese flags and all the preparations for Dakar, uh, for FOCAC that's going to happen in less than two <laughs> weeks is when the, the big forum on China-Africa Cooperation Ministerial Conference is coming up. So I wonder, I mean, it's going to be front and center. He won't be able to, to miss it. Yeah, I think, you know, it's always good to make clear that Africa has options. You know, I think that that's a powerful message to send. <laughs> no way to avoid that. And, and again, it's interesting that they chose Senegal to go to right before FOCAC. Again, maybe it's coincidence, who knows. But let's focus on the Chinese side of things today. And what we're going to do is delve into an area of Chinese engagement that is very poorly understood by outsiders as to what the motivations are for Chinese engagement in Africa. And we hear constantly from both African and international stakeholders about Chinese designs on predatory lending, on seizing assets, on neocolonial behavior. And none of that bears out in the evidence, according to Professor Tang Xiaoyang, who is at the Department of International Relations in Tsinghua University in Beijing. He's also the deputy director of the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy, one of the leading thinkers in China on African affairs. And it's really important to understand what people like Professor Tang think and how they frame these issues, because they are radically different than many of the prevailing and embedded narratives that we have in the West. And so Professor Tang, he published a new book in January of this year, Co-Evolutionary Pragmatism, Approaches and Impacts of China-Africa Economic Cooperation. Now, that's a very academic title. The key word, though, in that title is pragmatism. And pragmatism, at the end of the day, according to Professor Tang, is what's driving Chinese economic engagement in Africa. And in our discussion with him, he also alluded to the fact that it also motivates some of their political considerations as well. Pragmatism is the key. Let's hear from Professor Tang Xiaoyang about his book, Co-Evolutionary Pragmatism. We spoke with him last week. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. Professor Tang, welcome back to the show. It's wonderful to have you on the program and congratulations on the book that you released earlier this year. Thank you very much, Eric. Well, you argue in the book that China's approach to economic engagement in Africa is not ideologically or politically driven. Rather, you say it's motivated by what you call pragmatic considerations. Can you explain what you mean when you say co-evolutionary pragmatism? That sounds very academic-y, so if you could break that down for us, that would be helpful. Sure. And uh, yeah, I can break it into two parts. So the first, pragmatism. 
So it means uh, the economic development, but it's not uh, only about individual uh, like uh, growth. It's about uh, the goal of the society or and the country in China. They have changed towards the pursuit of continuous productivity growth. So this is uh, the shift of China's uh, uh, whole society and also the national strategy. And uh, then the best, uh, then second part is the co-evolutionary. So the best way to realize this uh, overall productivity growth and also the sustainable growth is the industrialization. And also correspondingly, you need a massive uh, market economy. Need a, so therefore it requires uh, the production and the living styles of the whole traditional society to change. So in fact, everything in the traditional society should change. And uh, this is uh, all everybody and every like aspect of life. Uh, they should uh, learn how to fit to each other in this co-evolution. And this is about China's own reform and why, uh, how it uh, like uh, gets developed. And now China also wants Africa to pursue the goal of uh, continuous productivity growth and also wants African countries to change, make this uh, industrialization and also market-oriented reform, this kind of change as well. You argue that um, the liberal market orthodoxy that, that we know as the Washington Consensus has, has generally failed in Africa, um, particularly it's, it's, it's failed in delivering infrastructure um, and with it that, that kind of development impact of infrastructure. Why do you think it failed? Is it, is it to do with the, with, the, with the Washington Consensus itself or does it have to also have to do with like African, African conditions? Uh, I think both uh, contribute uh, to the failure, but uh, on the side of uh, Washington, I think uh, it's uh, just uh, the idea of uh, liberal market, uh, it doesn't fit in Africa's situation. Because uh, the uh, free market, uh, and uh, yeah, it's actually the free should I add some uh, quotation mark on that. Because uh, the, even the Washington Consensus, their market is not really like uh, purely free, but it's rather based on the Western model. And then this kind of uh, established uh, and also based on w Western history, uh, this kind of market economy, when you want to transplant it into Africa, then this uh, doesn't work. Because in Africa, it, uh, when we want the individual, uh, we want uh, industrialization and also we want uh, market economy. But this kind of market economy, they should grow out of Africa's own context. And any this uh, imposed model, like the Washington Consensus uh, thinkers are proposing they do not work and they can just uh, remain like uh, external to Africa's uh, soil. Okay, if that's the case then, I mean, Africa is a continent of 54 countries. There is no African model. So if it's not the Western consensus or the Washington consensus, liberal market orthodoxy, whatever you want to call it, is it the Beijing consensus? Is that what you're suggesting is maybe there are China's model is more suitable for Africa? No, in fact, in my in the at the beginning of my book, I already uh, say it very clearly. The so-called Beijing consensus or China model, it's actually a wrong thesis. In fact, the so-called China model, it just has no model. So it's uh, this uh, flexibility and the yeah, you can call it uh, pragmatism. This works. In fact, China's more uh, the China's approach is to have the goal and then you have uh, uh, diverse and flexible approaches to reach that general goal. That's different from the Washington Consensus which actually has a model or has some principles and saying that you need to follow these principles. So China's model is a much more flexible and also it's goal-oriented. 
you know, I, I found it very interesting the way that you that you kind of outlined the kind of lessons learned in you know kind of among Chinese actors from failures and successes. Um, and I was wondering, um, you know, to to which extent, what, what kind of lessons were learned from from the resource backed loans that 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 came to be known as the the Angola model? Uh, you know, kind of where where countries essentially pay back. Like in loans for infrastructure through through commodities, those you know, like we, we've seen in the last while that that the Angolans, for example, are, are, have largely stepped away from that model. Um, and I was wondering what what lessons do you think were learned from that experience um, on the Chinese side? Uh, so the, uh, the resource backed loans uh, that's uh, actually just uh, one example of this uh, experimentation and it's only suitable for certain countries and at some moment so first uh, uh, i want to explain why the, it worked for Angola or some other countries in the like early, uh, yeah, like a past decade. So it's around 2004 to 2010. That's when these resource backed loans between China and African countries, they have a, a quite a good prospect. Because that time, uh, the Washington based institutes, they largely neglected the infrastructure Structure demands from Africa, and they just uh, le- want to leave this infrastructure to the private companies and to the like a free market. But it didn't work because infrastructure that's uh, not just uh, a commodity in the market, but it's also a precondition of the market. And uh, then you just uh, for the private companies, they don't want uh, just uh, invest in this uh, uh, poor and very risky key countries. But these countries for their national reconstruction they also want to have uh, the infrastructure. They they are very eager to have infrastructure construction. And at this moment then China actually uh, designed this uh, resource backed loans in combination with uh, uh, infrastructure construction. uh, Both together uh, partnered. And this is a way in which actually China can reduce a lot of uh, risk of simply lending to uh, Angola and other countries. As uh, actually people uh, said, uh, yeah, the embezzlement uh, or something like uh, uh, inefficient use uh, of uh, funds may be uh, quite uh, risky. But China actually combined this uh, uh, loans with uh, the construction projects. In fact, uh, during that process, no single dollar went to Angola's account, but just uh, like hundreds of infrastructure projects were put on the ground. So that uh, actually Angolan people, they also said that uh, they were happy to see this infrastructure yeah, come out of their oil resources, which actually they never knew uh, where their oil sales uh, went. But uh, for the first time, they saw their oil actually became the like roads and schools around them. But uh, later it changed. That's because uh, Angola actually when its uh, uh, credit rating uh, improved it wants uh, to use a 70 guarantee instead of oil guarantee because this will give the Angolan government more control over their oil revenue. And China also wants to improve because the oil backed loans. It's just a very, very basic EPC. But China wants also have more sophisticated models like BOT and also investment. So this is actually about the co-evolution. Both sides, they actually developed through this kind of experimentation. So so the, the Angola model was an experiment because back in 2008, on paper, I can imagine this made all the sense in the world. Back then, I'm looking at oil prices right now. May 2008, oil was well over $100 a barrel. So in that sense, it didn't take as much for uh, a country like Angola to repay some of those loans. But then you fast forward up to 2020 now, or even in the late eight, you know, 2018, 2017, and oil's at $50 a barrel. And that changes the equation a lot. And one of the problems that emerged from the Angola model 
was that so much oil was being devoted to repaying the Chinese loans that there was a capital crisis and inflation went up because there simply wasn't enough cash coming into the economy for a country like Angola that sells only oil for the most part. And so, again, I'm just kind of a little bit surprised that the Angola model is now seen in some respects as a success when, in fact, the Angolan government today says it doesn't want to do that anymore because of the effects of inflation. I do take your point about the evolutionary part of about learning of it, but do you still see it as a success given the fact that it had some real adverse economic impacts on Angola's uh, overall economy? Sure, this is actually the same as I just mentioned. So if uh, when China Chinese banks, like uh, export-import banks, they want to secure their uh, like uh, repayment, therefore they ask the Angolans to uh, deposit quite a large amount of their oil revenue in the account so that uh, these loans can be secured. But this actually causes the Angolan government actually lack of enough like cash for other things. So that's what I mean. If when these countries, they can actually not get the uh, like a better loan conditions from the financial market with better credit rating, they certainly then don't want to use this oil guarantee anymore. But however, in 2000, 2004, that time their credit rating was CCC. And that time, if they want to borrow from the financial market, they need to pay every month uh, like uh, more than 10% uh, interest. And at that time, uh, the oil-backed loans, uh, that's much cheaper for them. So this actually all depends. You can not say because it's uh, later, then it's uh, no longer uh, uh, like uh, uh, cheaper for Angola, then you said, okay, that time it was also a mistake. Actually, without uh, 2004, this oil-backed loans, Angola wouldn't be able to recover so quickly, and uh, then it wouldn't have such a good credit rating, so that it can, now can borrow from the international market cheaply. You write that um, that one of like looking at at the, at the whole of Africa um, that one of the big problems related to to Chinese um, infrastructure uh, debt in in Africa is that there's a lower than expected growth coming from these infrastructure projects. So you know it's not necessarily a situation that that one builds the infrastructure project and then there's this direct immediate kind of like growth effect that would then help help the the, the, the countries to then immediately repay those loads. Um, why do you think there's been less than expected growth coming from these these infrastructure projects? It is simply a situation that people were too optimistic about the growth prospects at the beginning uh, or like what, what are some of the what are some of the factors involved? I admit that uh, some uh, policy makers, decision makers, uh, they were quite optimistic, uh, like uh, around 2012 or 2015. At that time, therefore, they were uh, they actually pushed uh, these uh, projects uh, with more confidence. But however, I uh, my argument is still valid. So this is just a part part of this uh, experimentation. And uh, then uh, you need, in fact, uh, this uh, uh, transition towards market economy, it's actually also means uh, uh, at the same time the creation of market. So when you create something, you cannot uh, just uh, depend on like a uh, previous uh, experience uh, or some like uh, similar situations. That's actually what uh, the mainstream uh, Washington-based institutes, they often do. They actually like to borrow other experience and uh, borrow on the like previous uh, available data. But uh, this way, actually, they, are, they will be too cautious for this uh, 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 like, uh, new uh, developing countries. Because in these uh, developing countries, when you want to have this uh, 
co-evolution and uh, transition towards market economy, you require a lot of uh, stakeholders to make corresponding changes at the same time. And that's not an easy job. And uh, if you just uh, sit back and uh, calculate, uh, maybe you will fi- just uh, simply find that's too risky and uh, you cannot do that. So therefore, in China, this uh, uh, willingness to take uh, more risk and also especially the effort to coordinate uh, various stakeholders together to work uh, on this uh, project. These are more important, or at least as important as uh, the care for feasibility assessment. And I would say for the past maybe five or ten years, China actually they uh, not all the projects uh, are failures. Actually, China also learned the experience uh, from uh, some uh, more effective projects, but also lessons from some less effective projects. And I believe uh, that China uh, now the uh, bilateral these decision makers they may be more cautious than before, and they will like uh, do this uh, coordination and. Uh, orchestration, maybe focusing on um, fewer projects, but with a better coordination. Well, that's what we've been seeing over the past year or so, is that the lending by China's two main policy banks, the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank, has gone down quite a bit. Now, a lot of people have been misinterpreting that to say that Chinese lending overall is going down. What we're also seeing is that lending from state-owned enterprises, private enterprises, and other actors is also stepping up. So it's not necessarily that overall Chinese lending is going down, but it does feel that Chinese actors are becoming more risk-averse in places like Africa and not willing to take the big bets anymore on things like the standard gauge railway or big port projects, and they'd rather focus on these smaller projects in the 10 to 100 million range rather than the 1 to 6 billion range. What's your assessment of that? I think that's uh, normal for this uh, emerging economies. You always uh, have a more like a risk willingness, but uh, then you go too far and then you go back a little bit. And then uh, after you find regain confidence through more success projects, then you may yeah, uh, uh, may be willing to take more risk again. So within China, we during past four decades, we saw a lot of this kind of uh, fluctuation and back and forth. So that's not a big deal. And uh, for us, uh, what's important is actually if you do not change your like this fundamental goal of uh, uh, pursuing sustainable productivity growth and also uh, if you still continue your experimentation, then the trend will continue. The Biden administration recently announced that the Build Back Better World initiative that's supposed to be rolling out infrastructure um, in in the global south will officially start around January um, next year. Um, and so we were, I was wondering what you make of the Build Back Better World initiative and what what kind of lessons what kind of lessons you think they should take from from China's experience of building infrastructure in the global south and overall how optimistic you are that it will actually succeed. Yeah, I wish that uh, B3W can work, but uh, uh, I think uh, the. But however, from what uh, the uh, yeah, official announcement said, then I think it's uh, just uh, too idealistic, and uh, yeah. So I'm afraid that uh, this. Uh, uh, Talks may be great and fantastic, but when it comes to implementation, it will be just a very small amount number of projects, and then it cannot really like live up with the people's expectation. And the problem is, uh, I think the Biden administration wants to set a very high standard for the. Uh, other like infrastructure and also this uh, mm, 
development programs in the developing countries. Uh, but in fact, the, uh, the developing countries, they rather want some uh, more uh, realistic uh, projects, which is uh, uh, indeed uh, often uh, has a lot of uh, flaws due to their uh, yeah, general uh, constraints. So therefore, then, if you just uh, want to make this uh, project uh, sounds uh, beautiful and sounds uh, perfect, then this actually, at the same time, is uh, the most uh, fatal mistake for this kind of project. And as for like, uh, the uh, Biden administration also wanted to mobilize uh, like private capital and market forces to work in this B3W. But I also doubt that this may work because the business interests and also the economic structure in the Western countries, particularly in the US, they are not really like very, the business, especially the private business, they are interested in Africa and other underdeveloped countries are limited due to the risk cost concerns and also because uh, they they are like a uh, you know, economic structure is not really so compatible or so close and uh, so you can find a lot of mutual interests with this uh, underdeveloped countries. You, you know, it's interesting because I spoke with uh, some folks in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and they said that even if B3W isn't successful, the fact that a lot of the rhetoric from B3W is now making its way into China's own Belt and Road rhetoric. So the talk about high quality infrastructure, that is relatively new on the part of the Chinese. The talk of transparency is starting to come into the Chinese and sustainability. These are all references that did not exist in the Chinese language when it talked about BRI two or three, four years ago. And only because now in Washington, they feel that China's responding to the pressure from the U.S. and others about the criticisms of Chinese programs. But let's see if we can step back a little bit from the criticism and see, do you see any merits in what the U.S. is doing in trying to have diverse sources of funding so that there isn't a higher debt burden on these countries, particularly in like in Zambia, Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Angola, which have very high Chinese debt burdens that have not been restructured, and also more transparency. This is an issue that we're seeing in Liberia right now, where there's a resource for infrastructure deal for iron ore, and the George Way government is not making the contract public. We know from the aid data research that China has insisted on very strict secrecy clauses. So is there something that can be gained out of having some competition in the marketplace for new ways of financing infrastructure, even for the Chinese, beyond the U.S.-China disputes now over different models? Uh, certainly, actually, China is learning, and this is uh, actually the merit of this co-evolution process. In fact, uh, China never rejects any model uh, completely. It's uh, even within China, its own development has always been a way of uh, reform, but also opening. So the question is just uh, about uh, uh, when you talk about improvement, this actually should be considered with one country or with this China Africa, this process in general. So when we come to this uh, uh, debt burden issues, then we find, uh, uh, like uh, we said, uh, actually some countries maybe at the beginning, like uh, Zambia and uh, Ethiopia, they, uh, I uh, admit that uh, some of these banks, they give a little bit, uh, they were too uh, optimistic for a while. But in fact, already several years ago, Go. China already like uh, started uh, to limit uh, its uh, lending or disbursement uh, to Zambia, and also when it comes to uh, Ethiopia, then China uh, uh, has made a lot of effort to try to boost the like uh, use of the uh, railway and also try to uh, yeah, help the Ethiopian government. Uh, 
I restructure the loans, and this uh, kind of uh, activities they just learn from the experiments. And when it comes to uh, like sustainability, actually this is not because of the pressure, but China has already. Uh, long been the first uh, uh, like a producer, the world's uh, biggest producer of solar energy, of uh, wind energy. So China has uh, been moving much faster than the U.S. in terms of uh, this green business. And uh, so it's not actually not because of pressure. Uh, it's rather through the uh, yeah the in, uh, internal this uh, need. So. People wants to improve. China never said we just want pollution, but China actually has the sustainability is itself about the development. So China, when it reaches a certain stage, it always wants to improve the environment and also improve the management style and then the government governance and also communication with other parts of the world. I think this is uh, maybe one way China learned from uh, uh, yeah, the criticism. When you say China doesn't uh, uh, communicate enough, then actually I see also even Chinese uh, high rank officials, they are willing to talk to the media, right? talk to people uh, uh, like you, and uh, they even uh, they appreciate your work. I think this is uh, all about uh, China actually continuous uh, to learn and uh, continue their learning process and uh, that's not because of pressure but it's rather because uh, China find uh, yeah China find out there's uh, indeed a need and uh, if the, the like this pressure China find uh, this is not really um Reasonable, even when you criticize very hard, or you use harsh criticism, you want to cohesive pressure, then China will reject that. So I think this is also comes to this. Uh, uh, maybe about the confidentiality. This, I think, uh, quite a part is about the misunderstanding of uh, China's uh, more, uh, like approach. Because for China, the lot of these uh, loans by China Development Bank or even China Export Import Bank, these are all commercial loans, and it's okay for commercial banks to keep some uh, commercial secret, and also when it comes to uh, debt cancellation, you cannot require these loans to cancel the uh, commercial loans just like the uh, foreign aid concessional loans. I think there's some uh, like a misunderstanding in that part between the like uh, uh, World Bank and the Chinese uh, banks. So therefore, in that uh, regard, then China actually resisted this kind of pressure. I was wondering what kind of lessons you think Chinese policymakers are taking from the political developments that we've seen in some African countries with with um, heavy invest heavy Chinese investments. So you know, for example, in the recent recent coups in in Sudan, um, the you know the the ongoing problems in South Sudan and and the recent political problems in in Ethiopia. So you know the 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 you know one of one of the Chinese approaches which which I personally think. Is, is actually, you know, is, is a really interesting approach. Is this, you know, kind of focus on development as a form of, of creating stability in, in, in a society? Um, so one, one needs to kind of like already invest in countries that are the, even if they are unstable at the moment in order to create stability in the future. Um, so I was wondering, you know, kind of now that we're seeing, you know, kind of these, these kind of crises, kind of political crises happening in Africa, what kind of lessons do you think policymakers in China will take from those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Kobus, uh, you rightly pointed out uh, that uh, indeed some uh, Chinese they think uh, the like uh, econo uh, economy development uh, will help uh, stability. Maybe they learned from uh, the story of Ethiopia that uh, this may not really be the case, especially when the country is fra fragile. But in fact, in my book, I have a different argument. I would uh, rather say China, uh, 
actually for this uh, like a political instability, China still can insists its own policy of non interference and of uh, uh, like leaving this uh, like conflict better to the people themselves to solve. That uh, actually shows China's uh, political position is uh, actually just uh, very similar and uh, to the. Uh, this uh, anti-imperialism and also China's uh, political policy is actually to support national independence, which actually China, uh, the People's Republic of China, had this kind of position since the uh, its own independence and throughout this uh, year or during Chairman Mao and uh, yeah afterwards. So I think this kind of uh, political policies uh, they have not. Being changed, but what changed is China told the African countries, "You want to, if you want to, like uh, uh, resist the imperialist power, if you want to really get your national independence and resist the new colonialism, your goal is actually to have the sustainable economic development, and that's uh, what uh, China." Uh, Got from its own experience and wants to share this with the African countries. So this is what I actually called in my uh, book in the concluding part. This is the political subtext of this co-evolutionary pragmatism. Although it looks like China pushes just this African countries to. Get uh, economic development uh, to pursue, uh, yeah, growth, but uh, to do business. But all this uh, encouragement, it actually based on China's own experience of getting independent, of uh, get, getting stronger, so that you can resist uh, the pressure and uh, you can really become uh, independent and uh, yeah, so equal to the uh, to this.、Uh, Uh, advanced countries. So I think this is also what、uh, China wants to tell these African countries. And、uh, for this.、Uh Political instability. I think、uh, China would,、uh, yeah, still continue its policy of、uh, non-interference and let these countries uh, uh, to solve these conflicts themselves. And、uh, meanwhile, I think、uh, China would,、uh, yeah, stay uh, like uh, in a distance from,、uh, yeah, with its、uh, economic cooperation. Maybe for a while, China understands now better. That in these uh, uh, countries, uh, maybe the uh, instability and this conflict risks are still very high, and、uh, China will be more cautious in that regard. But I think this、uh, doesn't change the general political and、uh, economic policy of China. Yeah, this is this is the core of the problem right now between the United States and China over Ethiopia, where the United States. Believes that unilateral action can have an impact, and impact, and this goes back to the Rwanda genocide, where President Bill Clinton said the biggest mistake of his presidency was not doing something to help protect the the Tutsi minority that was there. You know, and so there's a there's a fundamental philosophical difference between the United States and China. On whether to intervene or not intervene, and in the United States, many people feel there's a moral obligation if the government itself is the one that is hurting people. But China, at the end of the day, also has this non-interference doctrine, as you've ta- talked about, and we are seeing that dispute and those two different philosophies right now play out over Ethiopia.、Uh, very quickly before we go, we want to make sure that we get your input on the upcoming forum on China Africa cooperation conference that will be happening at the end of the month in Dakar. Tell us what you are expecting、uh, of this conference because it's coming at a time. Where there's a lot of change in the China Africa relationship, we've talked about the changing relationship on debt financing, on infrastructure financing, obviously on non-interference and political issues, 
A lot is going on. What are you expecting from this conference? Mm-hmm. I think the conference uh, is uh, will have uh, some focus on the COVID recovery, post COVID recovery. But uh, I think uh, this uh, COVID is just a short term issue. Uh, although the debt uh, burden and also the yeah economic difficult or difficulty, including the yeah travel restrictions. This uh, cost uh, it cost a lot of problems, uh, but uh, uh, in fact, uh, I think the structural transformation uh, for China and uh, for the African countries, uh, this uh, long term trend uh, they won't uh, be changed because of the pandemic. So this uh, momentum of uh, mutual beneficial uh, economic cooperation, they are still there, and. Uh, the industrialization will still be a very important theme, but uh, maybe with the like a uh, COVID uh, situation, then some new elements uh, will be added, like the digital economy and also this uh, pan continent uh, uh, free trade agreement. China, I think, very likely will address that, and also emphasis on healthcare. This is also very possible, and uh, so this uh, new issues will be just be added to this uh, uh, in general very consistent uh, long trend and uh, but uh, I think because this uh, uh, meeting in Dakar it was going to be a combination between online and offline so uh, perhaps uh, the yeah, it's also uh, I think the really a new format, and uh, I think this uh, will be interesting to observe uh, to see how the uh, each uh, how China and this more than fifty countries how they they can uh, yeah can understand uh, each other and uh, communicate each other efficiently in this kind of uh, combined forms, but I think this will just uh, be. Be a uh, uh, further you know, like a milestone in this uh, long way between the two parts towards uh, the uh, yeah, mutual beneficial development. You know, it, it strikes me that the, this narrative that that you're sketching of this co-evolution of particularly China and and African countries evolving together, um, you know, and in order to find better and better solutions. Um, what kind of evolution do you think is needed on the African side, particularly, particularly, you know, kind of facing the, the fact that 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 China is is facing more pressures at the moment than they were, say, ten years ago? You know, kind of, it's 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 reshaping China's options in in terms of what it can finance um, safely um, or sustainably. Um, what kind of evolution do you think is needed on the African side to to get the most out of the 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 Chinese? investments in the next 10 years or so? Yeah, thank you, Corbus. That's a great question. And uh, I actually would uh, like to emphasize that the Africans, they need to uh, change more, do more evolution more uh, quickly. And uh, that's uh, actually a question we uh, recently often see in the Debates about African agents. In fact, African uh, they need to do the most comprehensive evolution from the entrepreneurship, from the labor forces, from education, and from market regulation and government governance. So it's not just about market and government, but it's really every part of the society. In fact, we even need better better and more consumers in Africa. And also, of course, infrastructure. So that this uh, industrialization and uh, this uh, uh, transition towards market economy can move more f- uh, move faster. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, in fact, China, is, after 10 years, China's economic structure has already reached a stage which China may 
Uh, it's uh, unlike in the like early two、uh, thousand. In that time, China has、uh, this uh, like uh, cheap goods uh, and also、um, more like resource demand. And、uh, yeah, this time、uh, maybe both sides、uh, can. The standard China also faced less uh, this uh, uh, concerns uh, from、uh, various parts, and but now China itself has grown so much in during the past twenty、uh, years, and、uh, it has、uh, reached、uh, a stage which almost like the advanced economy, and、uh, the its wage is so high. It's actually not about、uh, the labor real. Location because China doesn't relocate so many labors to Africa. It's rather relocate to Southeast Asia, or in fact use the automatic machines for itself. So and、uh, but uh, then it's uh, uh, doesn't China just feel it's、um, getting more and more expensive to build infrastructure in Africa and also its products in China China made products they have higher quality and they have higher environmental standards but they meanwhile also become more expensive and these are not necessarily good things for African consumers because they cannot. For that, although then we see、uh, Chinese investments are increasing in Africa, that's actually a positive sign. So the, we see the cell phones, we see also some online education companies,、uh, and also the、uh, industry production companies. They go to Africa. These are actually are good signs. But、uh, however, if Africa they Africans, they do not create uh, like a、uh, friendly and uh, uh, business environment to attract more and more Chinese investments, and、uh, to also produce their own indigenous entrepreneurs. Then maybe China in at the end will like、uh, the Western countries find its、uh, the cost and the risk of. Doing business with Africa is no longer so、uh, as attractive as before, and that will be difficult. Will be actually、uh, a challenge for Africa. So I want to say that African society really need to co-evolve、uh, as fast as China, and so that it can become、uh, industry bases, can become prospering markets, can become. Um, safe and、uh, yeah. Secure societies welcoming the foreign investors and、uh, foreign traders. I am so glad that you mentioned that the Chinese offshoring of manufacturing for export is largely coming here to Southeast Asia. But what we are seeing in Africa more is Chinese manufacturing for the African market itself. Companies like Hisense, the big automakers, are all starting to set up manufacturing operations to sell products. In Africa, and that's I think a very interesting、uh, distinction to make. And I I think people should separate the offshoring manufacturing where China sells products to the world. That's coming here in Southeast Asia and to South Asia. But for the African market itself, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the manufacturing side from Chinese companies、uh, for the African market. The book is Co Evolutionary Pragmatism. Approaches and impacts of China-Africa economic cooperation. It's one of the most important books from a Chinese perspective on China-Africa relations. You can buy it on Amazon.com. It's a little pricey. It's one of those academic books. But if you are in a library in the United States at any major university or think tank, it's probably there. And if it's not there, You should go to the librarian and ask them to get it. It was written by Professor Tang Xiaoyang from the Department of International Relations at Tsinghua University in Beijing, and he's also the deputy director of the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Professor Tang, thank you so much again for joining us and for sharing all of your breadth of insights with us. It's a great way for us to go into the FOCAC Summit this month. We're looking at FOCAC, and we're so excited to have had the opportunity to speak with you. Yes, wonderful to talk to you, Eric and Kobus. Kobus, it is so enlightening for me every time we have Professor Tang on the show. Again, he really provides a different way of looking at some of these things. Throughout our discussion with Professor Tang, I couldn't help but think 
about some of the aid data analysis that Brad Parks and the team over there gave us a couple of weeks ago. And what they said was very interesting. And, and this, this really ties back to the question of pragmatism, that at the end of the day for the loans, the priority for China was making sure the loans were paid back and making sure that they were profitable. It was, if anything, predatory capitalism more than, say, predatory lending with a political objective to it. That was one of the key takeaways from the aid data report. And it ties into this idea of the decisions are pragmatically motivated. And again, I come back to this idea that I think that concept is very poorly understood by policymakers in many Western capitals. Yeah, I completely agree. I think one, it, it also... It also really shows how weak the the kind of uh, uh, kind of underlying thinking is in relation to kind of the new Cold War narrative that we're seeing really being promoted in the U.S. Um, you know, which which tends to kind of assume that you know, like, like you know, kind of taking the model of of the old Cold War that um, that this kind of global expansion and influence building is is primarily political. Um, you know, kind of rather than this kind of complicated kind of entanglement of politics and economics the way that that we're seeing in contemporary China, um, and you know, so so and and so that I think it kind of then kind of sets a trap I think for a lot of thinkers to just assume that something like lending, for example, is primarily about influence building rather than having influence building be in the mix, but like actual making actual money being a very big part of part of the calculus. Yeah, but just to be fair here, I think we're hearing that out. Even in our discussion with Professor Tang, there were some references to the United States, and you hear that, that Cold War mindset. I mean, the Chinese are very quick to accuse the Americans of engaging in a new Cold War mentality. But yet when you look at Chinese press, Chinese Twitter, Chinese social media, uh, boy, they are poised and defensive and and ready to attack as well. I mean, I think that these two countries really in many ways are on the same wavelength as these things. And we even heard hints of that in our discussion with Professor Tang. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely, that's that's true. Um, what what did you think of the concept of pragmatism itself? Like, you know, kind of, does, does, you know, because pragmatism always obviously has this kind of this this kind of feeling of or kind of implication of well, you know, kind of we're not we're not swayed by by kind of emotion. We're just trying to make things work. Like, do you think do you think that kind of encompasses the the kind of complexity of the engagement? Well, yes and no. Let me take you back to one of these little tiny news stories that I found last week. And it was a small aid program. In fact, I think it was so small that they didn't even announce the dollar amount. You know, when when they have big aid programs, they're always keen to say $100 million, you know, for X. When it's so small, they just say China, and in this case, the Gambia, signed a a, a technical cooperation agreement or something like that. And it was, they didn't even give the dollar amount. What was interesting, though, was that in the Xinhua press release about this tiny little aid program, the second paragraph was about how the Gambia supports China's one China policy. Okay? What in the world does the one China policy have anything to do with a technical cooperation agreement with the Gambia? And what it says to me, though, is that China is pragmatic maybe on any issue outside of 4THK XJS. That's my little acronym. Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, the party, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, South China Sea. If somebody crosses those red lines, all the pragmatism in the world goes away. And then the emotions kick up. So I think, yes, there's pragmatism, but to a point, right? It's not, you know, entirely pragmatic. So ultimate true pragmatism would be If country X says, we are going to invite the Dalai Lama, we are going to side with the United States on Xinjiang, we are going to, you know, oppose Chinese policies in Hong Kong, all of those red flag issues that I can already feel Chinese Twitter mobilizing against me, even just saying it, okay? Ultimate pragmatism would be, yep, we'll put that aside because we have an objective in that country. But that won't happen. The emotions will stir up very, very quickly. So I'm not entirely sure that it's 100% pragmatic. However, when you look at a significant portion of Chinese economic decisions in many parts of Africa, pragmatism is a very important factor. So, but it's not, I don't think it explains everything. 
I think in lots of ways, you know, Africa is such a kind of a pragmatic space for them because even if some random African country decides to to take positions on all of these red line issues, which, you know, can you imagine? Um, even then, it doesn't particularly hurt China, you know, kind of compared to, you know, compared to, say, um, you know, if, if, if a, a prominent kind of Southeast Asian entity, like country, you know, decided to take that that stance, you know. Um, so so I think even, so, so, so there, there is an aspect there where pragmatism is, I think, is a very appropriate kind of word for, for, for China's approach in Africa particularly, maybe more than other parts of the global south. Um, you know, because because even if one of these countries decides to really, like, go against the grain in all of these different ways, it's essentially no skin off China's nose. I don't know if I entirely agree with that, because China values the symbolism as much as anything else. And also, it is concerned about precedent setting. And I think it would also be concerned that the United States or China's critics would take one of these examples and leverage it, amplify it, and say, aha, you see? And, and that would be the bigger concern. So I think even if a small country crossed a Chinese red line, it could provoke a rather severe backlash, is my, is my suspicion. Yes, no, I mean, I definitely, and, and, and as you say, the, the symbolism and the precedence means that, that the, the irrelevance of that, of, that, of that kind of, of the, the, the lack of impact of that stance on China's actual life will, you know, will, wouldn't count for much. They, they would kind of crack down on that country for the symbolism reason alone. Um, but, you know, but, but even so, like I think in, 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 you know, kind of in, in like kind of hard-nosed kind of calculus of, 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 of how much they're affected, you know, the African space, I think, does count as this kind of pragmatic space of trying stuff out you know because because even even if it does kind of go south in that way it still doesn't actually materially affect china that much that's that's more what i meant it's true in reverse as well and i think that many all african countries policies towards china is also driven by pragmatism as well i think that's a very good word to define uh, many african countries foreign policy and this is goes back to my old statement about the Jay-Z rule of foreign policy, I've got 99 problems and Xinjiang's not one. And it's just not pragmatic to get involved in these you know, really, really sensitive issues and into the US-China spat and all of these different areas that don't at the end of the day pursue a national security or economic interest for African country X, Y, or Z. That, to me, is also an expression of pragmatism. Yeah, and with that, then, I think also P Professor Tang's work also, in, like, I think, show, or like point, points in the direction of, of, of how the non-interference policy, you know, kind of for China is, in, in effect, a form of pragmatism. Um, you know, that, that frequently Chinese officials don't necessarily have the, the, the kind of background or the, or the, the, you know, the knowledge to be able to weigh in on, say, the internal politics of a particular African country. And so therefore they don't. You know, kind of therefore they they kind of they step back, they leave this, you know, kind of to the non-interference policy and they only focus on things that, that particularly you know kind of concern them, which is Chinese stuff, you know. Um, so 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 I can see from their perspective that 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 while from the US's perspective it, it, it frequently seems that China is supporting, actively supporting autocracies or refusing to you know to to kind of use its power to 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 comment on on human rights abuses i think frequently from the chinese side is you know what we don't need this problem you know kind of like like this isn't our issue we, we we're just like dealing with our little thing one area to put professor tang's theory to the test of course is in the countries in north africa and in the horn of africa that have undergone forced political changes i'm talking about guinea sudan mali Ethiopia now is in turmoil and in flux, uh, but to see how the Chinese respond, and I think, Kobus, to your point, particularly in Ethiopia, where it is driven by pragmatism, and that is, in many ways, they have deep economic interest in Ethiopia. They are aligning themselves with the Abahi government, and in many ways, that is a pragmatic decision. Also, the loyalty that the Chinese have to the Ethiopian government cannot be overstated in part. Let's remember one very important thing. During the height of the COVID outbreak in Wuhan two years ago, Ethiopian Airlines was the only African airline that continued to fly and kept the trade routes open. And the Chinese value that type of commitment quite a bit. So in one sense, it's pragmatism. Loyalty, again, is another very powerful force. I don't know if that's pragmatism or not, but I think it's very interesting to think about Professor Tang's ideas on pragmatic engagement 
in these countries that are undergoing real profound change. Final thoughts to you before we take off. I think that Ethiopia is going to be a very interesting test case for this entire approach. Um, because a lot of a lot of the investments that the Chinese made there were also quite kind of pragmatically development think development forward kind of investments. You know, kind of it wasn't only only focusing on hydrocarbons the way that their big investments in in South Sudan was, for example, um, which is it was another example of, of pragmatism kind of hitting a wall of like African political complications. Um, you know, now in Ethiopia, though, those their investments were a lot in, in manufacturing. It was like very, um, you know, kind of employment creating. It was in lots of ways the kind of the kind of. Um, you know, emblem of this kind of Chinese pragmatic developmental focus on, on, on investment in Africa. And now that approach is driving square into a wall of African political complications. Um, and, you know, so so I think, I think how not only the Chinese government, but also all of these Chinese companies that are invested in, in those special economic zones, how they react to, to the, the, the crisis in Ethiopia, I think is going to be very telling. Once again, the book is Co-Evolutionary Pragmatism, Approaches and Impacts of China-Africa Economic Cooperation by Professor Tang Xiaoyang. It's on Amazon. Regrettably, though, it is one of those very expensive academic prices, so like $100 for the book. But if you are in a university library or some research institute, uh, number one, if they don't have it, I highly recommend it. Professor Tang is very influential. His ideas are very, very innovative and very interesting to follow what he's thinking these days. So we're grateful for Professor Tang's time to join us on the show. We're also very grateful to you for listening this far into the program. And if you would like to follow what we're doing every day, Professor Tang just signed up for our newsletter and our website, and we would like you to join our growing community of readers around the world. Go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. You'll get 30 days for free just to try it out. That'll give you access to thousands of articles in the archive. All of our podcasts now have transcripts on them, so it makes it easy to search for what our guests have said in the past. And uh, also, you'll get our newsletter delivered to your inbox every morning at 6 a.m. Washington time. That's 6 p.m. out here in Asia. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, for Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. For more information about the China Africa Project, go to chinaafricaproject.com. Project.com.